video we mentioned and kind of ended on one of the techniques around creative thinking, which was the contrarian. So I figured we'd start with this one today and go over three things that work really well. And I'm particularly thinking about a sort of sales or marketing kind of bent on this, right? Which is to say, if you want to show your clients that not only are you different, but that you think differently, and there's an advantage and a possibly a competitive or market advantage to how you think, then you need to know good, reliable ways to come up with different things than what everyone else is saying and thinking. Mm -hmm. And the very first and easiest one that almost all of us, because all of us are a bit contrarian some of the time, at least, is to just take whatever anyone is saying or believing or even what you're saying or doing or believing and just say, that's wrong. Here's why. And then work to come up, take a few minutes. It doesn't take very long. Usually come up with reasons to argue against why someone, why something is true or why you think something is true. It's the, it's, it's very reliable. We're going to get to um, another one that's even more reliable for letting people think you're smart, but this one is very reliable. <laughs> just just think. take the opposite view and, and explore it. And you will find on every issue and every assumption or belief or whatever, that there are things that are valid on the other side of any argument. And there are many sides to every argument. And from those valid alternatives, you can craft together a messaging when you're talking to prospective clients or you're trying to expand the amount of business you're doing with a, with a, a current client to sort of widen their horizons and ensure that they understand that you're thinking about stuff differently than everyone else. And so they're not going to get, you know, the same mediocre results they're going to get from everyone else they're talking to. So this is like this beyond the high school. You really love the contrarian one. Yeah. I love contrarian. So this is like beyond the high school debate team. Oh yeah. It's not yeah. that, okay. you know, like abortion's good. Okay. Now abortion's bad. Are you that? <laughs> right. <laughs> but I mean, for everything you can think of, we should be advertising more on social media. Like, okay, that's wrong. Here's why. Right? I'm yeah. not saying that it's wrong to advertise social media. I'm saying there are other ways to think about it. Explore those and at least have them in your pocket when you're talking to your clients. Yeah. There's nothing worse than being caught short because you haven't thought something through for the sake of spending three minutes on being a contrarian and being ready with the arguments for them. Anyone want to be a contrarian and argue against me arguing against? <laughs> so this is the the non non yeah the non 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 non. You know it's it's I, I do appreciate being a contrarian and and I tend to take that stance a lot. Yeah, mainly just to shake people up and to create pattern interrupts. Yeah. On the other hand. If you're interested in peace of mind and having a lot of harmony within any group, organization, tribe, I mean, or family, for that matter, it's not better to not always be a contrarian. No, I'm okay with being a contrarian. It's fine. I'm okay with pushing against. Ideas and, and beliefs are, are really fragile, right? I don't mean they break easily. I'm, they're, they're, they're not strong in the sense that they're kind of like a balloon with air in it. And you can definitely push into it. And create a different shape. What well, you may not pop it, but you might deflate it somewhere. Yeah, or just reshape it into a giraffe. Right, that giraffe. We're going to do balloon animals today. Oh yeah, we're all nice. <laughs> balloon animals. All right. So then the next one, especially around marketing, not so much in sales, but especially around marketing, is to start looking or thinking about the edges. There are a lot of edges. I've got like a note that I keep where it must have like a hundred different types of edges you can go to in a market, and so. If you're, you know, if you are in the food business or you make like a snack, it could be, you know, saltier than everything, sweeter than everything else, spicier, more savory, smaller, bigger, harder, softer. Like there's an edge in any direction that you look in. There is a horizon, right? right. You can go to that horizon and in many cases be one of the very few competitors in that space. And if you can manage to pull together two horizons at the same time, two edges, then you're almost certainly going to be the only competitor in that space. Crisper and funnier. There you go. See? 
sweeter, but hot. Hot and sweet, baby. Yeah, but hotter. So it's it's more than always. Right, right. I mean, we're not talking about, you know, adding a tiny bit of heat. We're talking about like adding a Carolina Reaper kind of thing. Uh, yeah. Right. Or to go open. right out to an edge. Now you can come back a bit from the edge, but the, the thing about edges are they're instantly memorable mm -hmm. to the people that you're communicating with. So maybe you only deal with billionaires. Maybe you only work for nonprofits who help single okay. mothers yeah. that have yeah. green eyes and nine fingers. I mean, I'm not saying that the, the challenge with the edges, I do not know. Nine fingered, fingered green eyed Nine fingered mom. green eyed single mothers. Mm. Interesting. I don't uh, quite a the only caution I have on the edge, it's always worthwhile to think about where you would be and what edge you could you could own. Yeah. The only thing is, and I forget, it might have been the um, an, an economist, uh, Galbraith, I think. Oh, yeah. John Kenneth. Yeah. John Kenneth, right. I think this quote is attributable to him, which is that just because there's a gap in a market doesn't mean there's a market in that gap. Right. Maybe yeah, the, the gap, gap in the market exists because it doesn't make sense to compete in there. Yeah. Maybe there for a right. reason. Yeah. Maybe <laughs> we're not there yet in like having something that could actually you know, capitalize on a gap in a market. So Unless your store is called the gap. You're going to make money. But yeah. if there is a gap and no one else is there and there's a way to make money, mm -hmm. you should get in there. You're just throwing away money if you don't take advantage of that. And fall into the gap. And fall into the gap. Their slogan. So. Yeah. I can't. I'm, I'm trying to think of any of the other edges. This is why I have notes. These edges. Because right? Ed Ed I edginess. like it. Could you be edgier? That could be part of your... More than. Yeah. I mean, there are restaurants where you people go because the staff are famously surly, right? Yeah. Yeah. We got one. Durkin, Durkin Park. Durkin Park. <laughs> <laughs> there are clubs where you go to get insulted. There are comedians that you go to see live because they love hecklers from the audience yep. and they yep. embarrass them. And like, it's a thing. That's an edge that's case, one. right? Yeah. Yeah. That's the Rodney Dangerfield brand from long yes, ago. Rodney Dangerfield. Yeah. So you get yeah. a comedian like that. You get a comedian like... Uh, what's the guy's name who like makes fun of the fact how much he loves food and has the kids and lives in New York City? Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know who I'm talking about. Right? I know who you're talking about because uh, he's pocket, big. That guy. No, just, I, I can't believe I'm blanking on his name. I love Jim him. Gaffigan. Jim Gaffigan. So like, Jim oh, Gaffigan. Sorry, I got the two right? Jim. Yeah. One of my favorites, by the way. Yes. <laughs> And so uh, he has one of the greatest lines I've ever heard, which is shampoo is a terrible name for a product. Absolutely. It's got poo in it. And sham. <laughs> it's not even real. It's poo. a sham, too. Well, shampoo could be in some ways non-poo. So in that Maybe, case, it might yeah. be really good. So I'll be a contrarian to that remark. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> but there's always an edge. There's multiple edges. You should explore the edges. You might find that you're uniquely suited to an edge. And while the market is going to be a lot smaller, it usually pays more and you're the only one there charging. And that goes back kind of, uh, John, uh, a couple weeks ago when we were talking about some of the benefits of a halo niche, a halo. is that when people talk to you and say, well, how much does it cost? You're the only one that they're ever going to be able to talk to. So it costs what you say it costs. Mm -hmm. It's not That's like they can one. go on Upwork and find 19,000 other people who do the, on the exact same edge. I'd follow so, with what's in your wallet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the last one, also going back to something we talked about yesterday, is that literally everything is built on assumptions. And sometimes the assumptions are really rock solid. But even when they're rock solid, they're not. John and I were talking. Uh, we joined a couple of minutes before the live stream started. And I'm looking at a bunch of tripods and cameras that are like six feet away from me. And the makers of the tripod that's holding the camera that I'm looking at right now made an assumption that gravity would exist wherever I'm going to use the tripod. And yet you can think about, well, that means this tripod is definitely not suited to the space station. Right. And then no matter how gravity on Jupiter. like gravity will be there. You still can't always assume, right? Yeah. So somebody makes tripods or some way to mount a camera uh, in space stations and shuttles. Mm -hmm. that, that company like looked at it and said, you know what? What if gravity didn't exist? What if we can't assume that gravity will be there? How do we make something? That doesn't even depend on gravity. 
you position yourself as the zero gravity tripod yeah. specialist. Right. Yeah. There might be a gap there. Whatever you're thinking of, whatever <laughs> market you're in, whatever kind of customer you're going after, whatever. The uh, I mean, I'm, I'm I'm working through something like this right now because there are uh, in all of the companies that I talk to, all of the marketing departments for these mainly tech companies and complex manufacturing and stuff. Uh, they've always had the assumption that if you're going to have a webinar, you have to do it yourself. And they've never, ever thought about the fact that you could hand over the entire process to someone else to do it for you, except being the presenter, probably. And so uh, the, the response I get back is, I literally had no idea such a thing like this even existed. Let's talk. Well, these assumptions are really interesting because, you know, even... Even if you write a joke, you have to accept the premise yes. in order to get to the punchline. And, and so in this, an assumption. Yeah. yeah, it's an assumption. I mean, everything's an assumption. You know, if you're building a religion around uh, something, let's say you assume that there's a God and then every other idea flows out from that. Yeah. And you assume that all of the other gods and people who believe in them are wrong. Yeah. Another yeah. assumption. Right. <laughs> Um, uh, if you know the comedian Ricky Gervais, I saw a conversation once that he had with, I think it was Stephen Colbert. And um, I think Gervais is sort of like famously an atheist. Oh, yeah. And, and Colbert atheist. is kind of famously a Catholic. Exactly. Yeah. And he's, uh, he's, so Colbert says, so like, you're an atheist. You don't believe that there's a God. And uh, Gervais says, well, around the world, if you add them up, people collectively believe in about 3,000 gods, but you only believe in one. So you don't believe in 2,999 gods, and I believe in one fewer than you do. Now, that's a reframing. Yeah. Great. But like literally that. everything, literally everything is yeah. built on assumptions. Of course, you have to make assumptions or you'd never get out of bed. In fact, you couldn't even stay in bed because you're assuming you, you would not be crushed by a, a on-fire 747 that's about to come through your roof if you well, stay in bed. And you would you assume the sun will come up. You assume gravity will be working today when yeah. you get out of bed so that you don't need that zero gravity tripod. You assume today is not the day that uh, someone like needs to use the launch codes, right? Correct. Right. That's my assumption. That that's we're not the gonna assumption get you have to go through it. And yet <laughs> everything that seems stable is built on assumptions where almost certainly one or more of the assumptions it's built on is no longer valid. But enough stuff has been built up and around it that it's kind of like, um, a building like you see these building I don't want to go into politics you yeah. see like honeycombs <laughs> and, and termite like um, mounds and stuff where like chunks have been knocked out right something was there at one point and it, and it was the base that something else was built on the chunk mm. get knocked out and the thing still stands well your business is built upon trust upon faith that you can deliver something do yeah. some good in the world. And so it's that no like and trust factor or no love and trust right. factor, whatever you want to call it. It's it's it, it's the assumption is that you're good at what you do. Right. I mean, the foundation of every small business is that if someone else has a problem they're willing to pay to get solved. I mean, that's all a small business is, is someone paying someone else to solve their problem. Very good perspective. I like that. And mm -hmm. so you're assuming they're they're making assumptions on you being able to deliver, and you're making assumptions that the problem is worth someone's money to solve. You might be wrong, or you might be wrong in the other direction. You're not charging nearly enough. Yeah, but you can yeah. charge a lot more if you've got a really expensive coffee and you right. build it up to something spectacular. Yeah, mm -hmm. but if you look at everything especially anything that seems stable or anything that you depend on or anything that your prospects or customers depend on, I guarantee you one or more of the assumptions that it's based on is no longer true. It doesn't mean everything's going to fall down, but it means something's broken and there's an opportunity for you to fill the gap that the assumption no longer fills or that they're free of something that they thought they were constrained by, but really aren't anymore. It may not be the primary assumption for why the business exists. It no, could not be at all. a subsequent one, you know, right, customer yeah. service versus something else. I mean, look at the last two years. The assumption was that except in a few specific kinds of professions, working from home wasn't productive. 
and you couldn't right, right. run a company with everyone working from home, right? You might have a small software company and that could work. You could have like a design agency kind of thing that could work, but not if, you know, it's a kind of place where people need to show up at an office and get work done. And it turns out that the economy chugged along quite well. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. with and people actually got more done. Home, the population yeah. staying home. Yeah. People got more done at home than they did in the office because there yeah. wasn't water cooler conversation. There wasn't people right. distracting right. them in the break room, yeah. everything else like that. I mean, I've had to work either. I was traveling or working from a home office for the last 20 plus years. And then when a bunch of people, when everyone had at the corporate headquarters of the last company that I worked at when I had my last corporate job, when they all get sent home about a week and a half, two weeks in, I was having a conversation and, um, one of my coworkers was talking about to me, just as a one-to-one -one conversation, how it didn't seem like there was as much to do anymore. Like business must be slowing down. And I said, well, think about it. You're doing as much as you've ever done. It's just that no one ever bothered to tell you that if you go into an office, it takes eight hours to do three hours of work. Yeah. yeah. Now it's you do three hours of work and you're wondering what the heck am I going to do for the rest? Of the day? It, it's the concept of business versus busyness. Right. Mm hmm so you strip away all of those assumptions. People, you know, need other people. People uh, want to be in open floor plans, which I despise. I, they're so noisy, I can't get anything. <laughs> right. Them, right? Me too. Right? People need to drive to work and then drive home and all of this stuff. And you just, all those assumptions get knocked down. And it turns out everything worked fine because the termite mound was, it still had enough. The main core of the whole thing wasn't the commuting and the being in the office and the water cooler and whatever. It wasn't any of that. It was just people who knew what they had to do and then doing it. And it didn't matter where they were. Mm -hmm. So I, I, everything yeah, yeah. stable is built on assumptions. And at least one of those assumptions is no longer true. It's worth your while to look at it and see what doesn't make sense anymore. Either something that was a constraint isn't a constraint anymore or something that was depended on isn't actually depended on anymore. And there's an opportunity there to make a new business. Cool. That's about it for me. What do you guys want to say? This is our last one. And since John and I started uh, last one of the month, cause it's the last day of the month. Also the end yep. of one, if you're in sales or anything else that requires wrapping up stuff, I'm sure, you know, by now it's the end of Q1, but um, we also talked about how let's get online and make videos every weekday that we can. Mm -hmm. And uh, we made 20 of them in March alone. Cool. Okay. From zero for all of the last many decades. Like yeah. this. zero to 20 in under 30 days. There you go. Yeah. That's very slow for a car, but you know, I. <laughs> yeah. It's not bad for a bicycle. <laughs> in life, it's not for someone who walks backwards. Exactly. I mean, it's interesting, too, about that the whole thing about the uh, the major assumption was made, particularly by middle managers, that butts in seats indicates productivity. Right. Yeah. You know, I always found that to be fascinating. And yet there and, and yet there's so many distractions. And plus, people are playing, you know, you've know, seen the old the memes and other things where people are playing solitaire while they're in the middle of a business yeah. meeting. And, and meetings are probably one of the biggest wastes of time. The assumption is that a meeting is going to make things happen. Yep. That's and a dangerous time assumption. Time yeah. Yeah. Or and you see it in me. air traffic, by the way, like yeah. tourism based air travel has come roaring back, mm -hmm. but business travel is still limping way behind it. Because I don't know if it'll ever recover. Need to travel much anymore. No. Right. Because right. there's not as much need. No. No. Pe people are more comfortable with Zoom and Restream and StreamYard yeah. and all these other things, and they can have all kinds of stuff at home. And you think about it too, the whole concept of commuting to an office is so bizarre. Yeah. When you have yeah. technology that enables you to still connect with people without the the gasoline consumption, the headaches, the motor right. vehicle accidents, traffic jams, Pollution. all the other things that go Pollution. along with it. Pouring liquefied uh, dinosaurs into your gas tank. Yeah. Liquefied. I thought they were liquefied plants, <laughs> not just dinosaurs. <laughs> A little bit of everything there. Vegetation. <laughs> Coal, everything right. else. It made no I, sense. But the assumption, so so every time you approach a webinar, Dean, do you run through these assumptions with the people for whom you're writing? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That, uh, and usually I don't like put them through the exercise. I do the mm -hmm. exercise. Oh. And then I, I, I go to them and say like, what about this? And what I like to do, and this is where I, I'll tell you, I, a hard rule is that I will always insist that as part of the sort of scripting and prep process, we come up with 
uh, with their help, at least two questions ourselves. Because the last thing you want is to turn over to a Q&A and it's just crickets. Right? right. Yeah. So we always come up with two questions that the host can ask or we can put in the chat or someone asks or they just like include it as part of the presentation. Like, I commonly get asked these two questions and I have styles of questions. Let me see if I can find it for you. Hmm, that's pretty I have, cool. I have six styles of questions. Styles of questions as opposed to the questions themselves or the right. style in which questions. you ask things. Like, right. If you were a tree, what kind of tree would you be? That's the Barbara Walters question, actually. That's from long ago. Put some okay, style in your questions. The, so the six okay. styles of questions. And actually, we run, is a little like, you know, no one's going to ever see this, but just in case, we run the second Tuesday of every month. I run with um, Heather Caven and usually a, a long form guest in a 30 minute thing. We have like this audience means business. It's like the monthly show, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I give, the interviewer, I give the, the guest rather, because I'm the interviewer and so is Heather. I said, here are the six questions that we want you to come up with. And they say, you want me to come up with the questions? I say, yeah, there's six styles. I'm going to give you six styles and you're going to like turn them into real questions. So the first one, and if in a webinar, you absolutely make this one the first one, is yeah. the scary question. It's just called the scary question. And here's okay. the scary question. I did a webinar um, yesterday for a client. It's like number yeah. one, right? And the scary question is a question that if you had time to prep for it, you're okay. But if someone had sandbagged you and surprised you with it, you'd be like, oh, crap. What am I going to do? What am I going to say? That's a fantastic question to open a Q&A period for with. Because there are a couple of major drop-off points for attendance and, and attention when mm -hmm. uh, with a webinar audience the the first drop off is when you pivot into the q a because mm -hmm. most q a's are just like deserts of mediocre bullshit <laughs> and then and there's a whole other reason for that one day one of the days you know we talked about the four you know the four main reasons people register and attend live webinars there's a whole like, other set of why people ask the questions that they ask in webinars and there's various reasons and most are self-serving and so on Right. But uh, that drop off, the other drop off, by the way, is when you pivot into your call to action right? or what you, you might unceremoniously call the pitch. Right. You're going to pitch me now and try to sell their stuff. But when you move into Q&A, a lot of people drop off. And yeah. so we, I always have the very first question, a scary question, because people will like, wow, I can't believe they asked that. I want to know the answer to that. Like the one for yesterday was they talked about here's a gigantic competitor of yours and here's their product. Why wouldn't I buy that? Mm. Like you would not want to get surprised by that question if you thought you were in front of a friendly crowd. Mm -hmm. But people will stop and listen. It's like, yeah, actually, yeah, I was kind of thinking that. Like, why would I? This uh, reminds me of my dad. The only insofar as I'm not going to take long. Well, this, what but... racket was this about? No, no, not another racket. It was that he used to do, he was a, an expert witness testifying yeah. in automobile cases in Western New York. Yeah. And so at one point he talked about feeling this particular muscle, the piriformis muscle, you know, which is in your, mm -hmm. in your beneath the glutei. And he said, so the, uh, the uh, opposing attorney, the defense attorney, which is really the insurance attorney, mm -hmm. asked him something about, you know, Dr. Vogelman. I said, he says, uh, you know, you're, you're saying that you can feel this muscle. Well, not even the orthopedic surgeon who previously testified says, you know, how can you possibly do that? And my dad just smiled sweetly, looked at the jury and said, I'm very good at what I do. There you go. <laughs> and I always remember that as that's just a great thing to remember that, you know, if you just, you can always come back with I'm very good at what I do. Yeah. Nobody is like me. I'm unique. So anyway, so, so what are these other, other, other styles? Other uh, styles. The questions. next one, the, the rest can be done in any order, but I recommend the scary one mm. be done first. Okay. Uh, the next one is the expected question with an unexpected answer, which is kind of what you just like. Oh, gave yeah. An example okay. of, yeah. Right. You know, they're going to hit you with something, but you pivot it and make yeah. it about something different right That's well literally way. pivoting because you turn to the jury you avoid the attorney right. yeah <laughs> and then the third one is the unexpected question now it, it can be hard for people to come up with an unexpected question but real and i usually have to help them work through a couple of alternatives for that but an unexpected question is okay well you 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 race cars for a living uh, i'll give you a great example uh this is like when i was a kid and i, I watched a show called nightline with ted koppel yeah think. Ah, so yes. Nightline. He's interviewing a high jumper who has just recently come back into the sport after losing their leg. Mm. And sort of the unexpected question is, so is losing a leg an advantage? Like, 
how could it possibly be an event? But it turns out it was. He said, yeah, it's like 11 pounds, 12 pounds of weight. I don't have to get, I don't have to, you know, because I always sort of give it off of one leg anyway to jump. Now there's 11 or 12 pounds of other leg I don't have to carry. Which means he can go into the Paralympics, but would disqualify him for the regular Olympics, yeah. I would imagine. Yeah. Would and the next one is the expected question with a bridge into a something else answer. So he said, and you see this with politicians a lot, right? It's mm -hmm. like, yeah, that's you know, mm -hmm. that's a great question, but really the the issue is you should be thinking about X because that's the you know blah blah blah, and they sort of like divert it, right? Uh, we I mean, build those in just because it keeps the odd. The whole point of these is to keep the audience thinking they're going down one lane and then you're in another lane, mm -hmm. and they won't yeah. hang up until they know how it's finished. Different and lane then, or different rabbit hole. Right. And then my other one is just a straight up, you're asking the wrong question question. So like we'll ask them the question and then they'll say their, their answer is, look, that's actually the wrong question. It's not about how much paid advertising you're doing on LinkedIn. It's about the consistency of your blog posts and, you know, connecting with people individually and finding yeah. influencers. Like so that you're going is out, you, the interviewer, are going down the wrong path. Your audience is going down the wrong path. This is the real thing that gets you to the positive future. So it's not a question. I mean, you're, you're giving that to them saying that's wrong. And then you follow it up with a question. Is that correct? Or... Yeah. We basically build okay. both parts for them. Got it. And then the last one is sort of a swing for the fences where you can just say, so if you could, if you didn't have the, the constraint, because you know, you're a one person business. And so you don't have really a lot of time for anything. If you didn't have that constraint or if you're, you know, you're in whatever, you know, you're a, you're in a, you're a strategy coach. And so if you could have any client and you just like put them out way out, almost to an edge, right? And you say, if you could go out to an edge, what edge would you pick and why? Mm -hmm. People like those mm -hmm. questions. Mm -hmm. well, the, the variation I've heard of that is that if you had a realistic magic wand, you know, what would, what would be the result? Yeah. What's a realistic magic wand? A realistic. That came from uh, Christian Michelson, who's yeah. a yeah, big coach and a little bit on the woo-woo side but it was interesting they always talk the realistic magic wand because they, they it, it took away a little bit of the fantasy of the magic wand right. and saying you know it's yeah. real don't now dream about do it. it but what would you do if you had yeah. what would you really do money right now exactly yeah so those are the six styles of questions that we use i like we those. always use the scary one Always use the scary one. Freak it's people always out. the first one because it's the one that'll hook the audience. You only need to hook them for a few minutes into a Q&A period. And nearly all of them will hang out for the rest of the Q&A. So is that hook designed to agitate pain or just to just like put them into a state of shock or fright? or Because you know? these are live events. Yeah. Part of the reason, and it depends on the individual, but anywhere from 10 to 50% of the reason people attend a live event is because something can go horribly wrong. Yeah. So, it's, like right? it's just human nature to like, yeah. you, you watch the guy on the tightrope and part of you is thinking, gee, I hope that guy's all right. And the other part's thinking, <laughs> how cool would it be if he splattered right onto the concrete down there? Oh, he's like, oh. <sighs> so people love that sort of, you know, tension, but they make the tension internally. You're not making it. You're just riding it. You're surfing it. Right. So the scary question surfs the tension that's already inside the audience. I like that. It's it surfs. It's like you're you're surfing across the conscious and you're kind of stimulating the subconscious yeah. know, in terms of danger. Danger, Will Robinson. Yeah. Everyone's got like a rubbernecker voyeur kind of mentality to some degree in any live event. And so yeah. we surf that right into because usually how attention works with an audience, if you can sort of pivot them or move them and sort of renew or refresh their attention level, then they're good for another several minutes of hanging out with you. Huh. Interesting. So that's what the scary question does. It resets their attention countdown timer, which everyone has, which is also why the first five minutes of a live event or uh, a webinar are so critical. Like I dispense with every part of the housekeeping and agenda. There is no agenda in any mm -hmm. of the stuff I write for people. There's no housekeeping section. We do tell them if you have a question, put it in the chat. We'll get to it. But that's it. That's as much housekeeping as anyone's allowed to do. Yeah, you're not going to tell them to close boring. close your other tabs or browsers, put away your phone. Right. Uh, yeah. You know, no more coffee for you. Here's uh, our agenda, and, blah, blah, blah. I also don't let people pee. give long introductions. Yeah. Right. My name is X. My title is X. And this is what and I do. I've done X, usually a three parter. Yeah. My name, my title, and you know, what makes me an expert worth listening to for the next 20 minutes. That's it. I like it. That's as much as they're yeah. allowed. And then they go like right it. into content. 
And we're yeah. always sort of like resetting them. Yeah. Well, I think I get annoyed sometimes when somebody spends like three to five minutes, you know, saying, well, we're just going to wait for people to show up. And yeah, how do are you all either. doing? Actually, Where are you from? A, a, we have a plan around that. So we have a, I, I call, but until you kick off and start saying, you know, what you're going to say in your main content, the audience is, I call the audience before the kickoff, the pre-audience. Pre and the pre-audience has to be entertained while wow. you're waiting. So, uh, and, and now in the ones I'm doing for most of the clients these days, they're shortened down to 30 minute sessions mm -hmm. anyway. So you don't have much pre-audience. And we right. start like militarily, regimentally, rigidly on the nose. And then we mm -hmm. go through. Mm -hmm. But for any of the longer ones, for where there's a pre-audience, we actually have like an anecdote or something, a little story. Uh, I recommend that they have a story about sort of the early days of their team or the early days of the company. And it, as long as that's two or th two or more years in the past, if you talk, and, and the anecdote is about how like a mistake you made, uh, mm -hmm. a wrong assumption, uh, a scary question you got, you know, something like that. That'll just keep the audience sort of mentally engaged that's until right. you do your real kickoff. And the whole point is you don't want to lose them because everyone joins. And even some people like to join sessions early and just do their work and stuff. Yeah, uh, until it really starts. But to me, those people, their countdown, their attention countdown timer has still started. And you're mm -hmm. only going to get somewhere from three to eight minutes of courtesy attention at the okay. beginning of a live event. And when that sort of, you know, glass is empty, empty, and not just like half full, but gone, then yeah. unless at that one second where they're about to click out, you happen to say something that's engaging for them, and the odds of that happening are very small, you've lost them. So yeah, we actually come up with a story ahead of time. And so we, and it's just sort of told casually, you know, cause we're sort of chatting while we're waiting for the session to kick off, mm -hmm. but that's what we're doing. We're like setting up to humanize and uh, create affinity with the client. It's a scripted casual <laughs> chat. You got it. Every <laughs> little bit. <It's> <laughs> I don't make webinars for these folks. I orchestrate webinars. Orchestra, yes. Every second is accounted for because I'm constantly petrified of losing anyone in the audience. Now, is that a three minute or five minute? You said up to eight minutes. That seems like a long time. You get about eight minutes of courtesy attention at mm -hmm. a maximum, and it is a very long time. But those are the mm -hmm. people who are always showing up five minutes early so that they can right. just be on. But they're still checking their mail and they probably got, you know, you on mute so that or themselves on mute or whatever, if it's a mute. Right. So that's the maximum that I've ever okay. really encountered in real life. But normally it's like three to five minutes. Mm, okay. So you have an anecdote or a little story or a little foible. It's like, oh, yeah, we, you know, we totally screwed the pooch on that one early on. We thought it was going to be <laughs> X. And it turns out the customers wanted this and we, you know, we had to turn it around. And boy, I, we had weekends where we really scrambled. You know, mm. uh, but we finally got that done. But I mean, I wouldn't want to go through that every day kind of stuff. Right. And then it's like, oh, yeah, well, they're, they're people like us. And if it's at least two years in the, in the past or further, people don't associate a failure that long ago with uh, the safety factor of can I trust these guys to work on my stuff tomorrow? The whole Seriously. thing is mapped out. It is as precisely done as a movie. Mm. Yeah. Anyway, let's get going. We're yeah, going okay. over it by a lot. A rabbit hole. That's yeah. right. It was good. There you it go. Was good. It was very good. I love the six questions. What's in that. the chat? Do we have yeah. anything in the chat? No, we're good. Oh, no, we're good. All good in the hood. Okay. We're good. It's like an ad. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a good one.